Thank you. We're excited to be here today. Uh, this is the Beyond Transfer panel. Thank you so much for joining. We're going to dive right in. We're going to keep this as a conversation with our panelists who will introduce themselves here in a moment. And I've got some questions for the conversation, but we'll also create space for Q&A toward the end here. So if you have burning questions, keep them in mind, and we'll open it up for conversation uh, as we move through the session. All right, so I am here with a tremendously esteemed group of colleagues, and I'm going to have them introduce themselves, and then we're going to dive in. Should I get started? Yeah, let's do it. All right, good. Good afternoon. I'm Marty Alvarado, and uh, as of, or uh, up until last Friday, I was the Executive Vice Chancellor for Equitable Student Learning Experience and Impact at the California Community College Chancellor's Office, uh, overseeing our community college network in California, roughly 116 campuses. Uh, and as of next Monday, I will be the Vice President of Post-Secondary Education and Training at JFF. So excited to be with you all this Great. afternoon. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kenyatta Lovett. I'm the Managing Director of Higher Education and Workforce at Educate Texas and a proud member of the Texas Transfer Alliance. Great. My name is Sarah Pingle. I'm a senior researcher at Ithaca SNR. And if you haven't heard of SNR before, we are a nonprofit higher ed consultancy group based in New York that believes in applying evidence to increase equity and access in post secondary education. Wonderful, thank you. And I'm Allison Cadlick with SOVA, and I'm serving as the moderator today. So Ascendium, uh, Ascendium is the philanthropy that brought us together for this panel today. So I just want to say a, a couple of words about them and the kind of conversation that they framed up for us here today. So Ascendium is a national philanthropy focused on increasing opportunity for learners from low-income backgrounds through post-secondary education and workforce training. And there is a grant-making portfolio that is focused on streamlining the transitions between and among post-secondary providers. And so Ascendium has been active in the space for many years. And as a result of uh, ongoing investments in the space, listening and learning alongside partners, including folks here on stage with me today, uh, Ascendium has been led to ask some bigger questions, some higher level questions. For those of us, and I'm assuming for many of you who are here today, you care a great deal about transfer student success, portability of learning, learner agency, credit mobility, recognition of learning, these things. But for those of us who are passionate about this work, uh, we have a lot, there's been a lot of work over a few decades without nearly the gains that we all want to see for today's students. And so Ascendium has been asking some fundamental questions, some fundamental first order questions, like is there a more holistic, comprehensive approach to the way prior learning and credit is handled, communicated, assessed, and applied toward a student's degree? compared with the relatively uh, siloed, complex, and opaque way that credit mobility happens for today's learners. Uh, what is the locus for change in higher education when it comes to our unprecedentedly and increasingly mobile learner population, right? Is the system, ecosystem, institutions, like what is the locus of change? What are the primary drivers of change or the units of change? How can post-secondary and workforce leaders work together at the appropriate altitude to unmake problems of our own making? I love the formulation of this, right? It's not about fixing a system that is broken. It's about remaking, dismantling, and causing our systems that were not created for the success of today's learners to work more effectively for them. And how can we accelerate this work? So, this is an exciting opportunity to be here with panelists working in some of the most challenging states on some of the biggest research questions facing us. And so what I'd like to do is turn it to the panel and ask each of you to talk for a couple of minutes about your overarching priorities, the work that you're doing. Um, Sarah, I'd like to start with you. Give us a sort of high level uh, picture and give us, a, give us a sense of the terrain in which we are working and then we'll move it through the panel for conversation. Great, thank you so much, Allison. So um, essentially, we really know and believe that people today are increasingly mobile. And I know you've put the question to me, but I'm gonna put one to the audience too. So you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to, because I don't wanna out anybody, but how many of us have changed our address since March of 2020? I'm seeing a few hands. How many people have changed employers since March of 2020? I have. 
And how many people have changed maybe where your children, if you have children, go to school or to childcare? Yeah, so tons of change. Today's post-secondary students are no different than the people that are in this room today, right? But the inertia of our current system is really towards students that can access two to four years of predictable stability. Not every student has access to two to four years of predictable stability, where they can live in the same place, keep working in the same place, be able to afford that continu continuity of maybe not working for money for, for a certain period of time. And so mobile f students really aren't our future, they are our present. And our systems need to start acting like it and start serving these students better. So of all of the students that started in post-secondary ed in the 2014-2015 year, and that's you know back, because now we need to see these students through completion, a full 45% of folks that finished an associate's degree did so by earning credits at more than one institution. And that's 67% for students that earned a bachelor's degree. Those numbers were higher than I expected them to be when I looked them up from the National Student Clearinghouse, and I'm seeing some nods across the room that maybe they're a little higher than you expected as well. Um, most students have credits from more than one institution before they complete their credential. And a full 21% of people aged 21 to 65 complete some kind of validated workplace learning on their way to earning a credential as well. So it's not just learning that's happening in the classroom and classrooms that are increasingly at multiple institutions, but learning that's happening in other places as well. Um, so like I raised my hand earlier as you know, changing jobs. I didn't just forget when I changed jobs all of the things that I had learned in my previous role before I took my next one. And I think like my supervisor who's in the room is probably glad that I didn't, right? Like people take their learning with them when they move through these different phases of their life. And that means that higher ed needs to act like that. And so we really um, worked with Ascendium and partnered with Ascendium to develop this framework for holistic credit mobility that really centers this multimodal learning accumulation of mobile students and asks how we can get students to a credential as quickly and efficiently as possible. So there's some, a little bit of level setting and data around the scope of the issue today. And with that, I'll, I'll pass it down. Great, thank you. All right, Kenyatta, tell us about the context in Texas. Sure, and it's important to note, uh, and we talked about this as fellow panelists, um, what you just heard was a reality that uh, we have designed systems, uh, uh, linear systems, for a non-linear reality. When we think about how many of us are actually working in the field that we majored in, how many of us changed our mind about our trajectory and had to find a place to get there, uh, we all in some way live a non-linear reality, but unfortunately the systems are built for you to go to, in a linear fashion, which is not necessarily realistic. Uh, so for the Texas Transfer Alliance, we started back in 2018 with the first phase of work. Um, and that work is really to get and form a table of leadership that's higher ed systems and other leaders uh, to think about how transfer can improve two year to four year across the state of Texas. Um, last year we decided to go ahead and close down phase one and then start to plan and design around phase two. And really excited about the, the framework that we built moving forward. That's an advancement, uh, it appreciates what happened in phase one, but it also matches up to the realities that were just shared. Uh, the first thing that we're doing in our new vision moving, moving forward in phase two is acknowledging the equity challenges. And equity can be sliced and diced in many different ways. And when we think about transfer and credit mobility, uh, there's bias in the system that we need to work on. There are systematic challenges that we need to work on. There is also an acknowledgement of achievement, post-secondary and workforce achievement that hasn't been uh, established that we want to work through. The other one is reestablishing our, our ecosystem. Is it really just two-year to four-year higher ed systems? Or where does it play for nonprofit privates or even sometimes uh, other non-traditional forms of post-secondary education. You know, how can we fit in, in an ecosystem, uh, great organizations that think about prior learning assessment, work experiences like Western Governors University. Uh, the second thing that we're moving to is really around credit mobility and, and it's important to mention when we talk credit mobility versus transfer, uh, what I love about it is it removes the power dynamic that currently is in place between two-year and four-year. You're, you're waiting on department chairs at the four-year institution and professors to determine what is valid and what is not valid, and that can always be and sometimes be subjective. But when we put pressure also on the two-year institutions on how you're accepting credits for dual credit, they have some work to do as well. So when you look throughout the entire regional ecosystem, 
um, we can see the credit mobility being really a responsibility for everyone to make good on the residents that need a good, healthy system to get them to a credential to career pathway. Uh, the other thing we want to, want to mention is that we are also looking at the, the unit of analysis for our work will be the regions. As you mentioned, students may move around from school districts to different colleges in the area and different post-secondary workforce experiences, but how can the larger ecosystem within the region uh, begin to think about how they want to better serve residents based on the assets that they have available? Uh, San Antonio is doing some really good work around their transfer compact where they've involved about 25 plus institutions to really think about how do we reduce the number of credits, how do we work through all of these different pathway problems and course objective problems to make sure that it, the onus is not necessarily on the student, but the onus is really on the institution to get there. And the last thing I'll say is all of this is to set ambitious goals to support the state's building a talent strong Texas goal for attainment. And in our, in our perspective as an alliance, uh, we're thinking about really understanding what gives the, the, the best proximity towards a degree for students that get them to that career pathway uh, moving long term. The conversation at higher ed and other training providers and education providers, we're facilitating a conversation between the resident and the career that they want to get into. If we are in the way of that, then I think that that impacts a lot of different issues that are currently sort of plaguing our communities, plaguing our states, and plaguing our nation. Great, thank you. All right, California. Oh my goodness, okay, California. Um, I'll start with, um, I think we've been focused on three key areas, equity, as was mentioned, uh, data, and uh, understanding student-centered structural change. Uh, there's so much I'd love to share, and we could get deep into the weeds on things like common course numbering and how we understand associate degree for transfer. Um, as I mentioned, we have 116 community colleges in California. We serve anywhere from 1.8 to 2 million students, and we have a number of four-year institutions, both public, private, nonprofit, private, for-profit. Um, what we really had to acknowledge was that every single transfer solution was very institutional centric, institution centric, and actually created more challenges for our transfer students. Uh, we also had to really take a hard look at the data and who was transferring and who was benefiting from some of these solutions and who uh, were not. Um, I don't know if it's too soon to pull up the slide, but I would love to have this visual come up. It's not my visual. Um, uh, futurist uh, Heather McGowan and, and her colleagues uh, pulled together this visual. It's probably very familiar for some. But what I would emphasize in California, particularly as I think about the equity challenge and the data challenge, um, we often make transfer solutions or we identify transfer solutions based on what we think as, as uh, professionals we are comfortable doing. What is going to be beneficial for us from a financial incentive, from a structural incentive, and what will be easiest for us to facilitate, or what is feasible for us to facilitate and accomplish. What we really don't talk about is who benefits from this and actually what problem are we trying to solve. So when we think about credit mobility, because that really has to be the, the conversation, uh, transfer, we already know the ecosystem of transfer. We've all been trying to solve the transfer problem for decades now. Um, we have a different problem that we have to be solving. And we have to think about this not from a transfer from my institution to your institution, particularly with hundreds and hundreds of colleges, even some uh, high concentrations of colleges within uh, particular regions and communities. We really have to think about what is the structure we need for students as they navigate a new economy, right? And no longer thinking about how do we front end all of their education and then send them off into the world but really how are we walking alongside them and how does credit mobility play into that if we're, and the structures we need to facilitate that if what we're really trying to do is be a lifelong resource for individuals as they navigate this new economy. And that's a different problem than trying to figure out how do I, how do I uh, assess equivalency of transcripts to see if you, what you've done previously fits into my world over here but it's much more how do I leverage what you're taking in your wagon from place to place to place and understand what you come with and how I augment and enhance that, right? And so part of what we've really had to wrestle with as we think about equity and how do we make data-informed decisions and understand who's benefiting is, one, how do we make the familiar strange, right? Uh, an amazing colleague of mine uh, used to press me on that every single time we'd have a conversation. How do we make the familiar strange? How do we unlearn what we think we know and begin to have different conversations and understand what the problem is? 
Um, but then how do we also understand how, well, let me rephrase that, who is benefiting from the solutions we put in place? Mm -hmm. Is it a faculty discipline member or a department? Is it an institution's bottom line? Or is it actually the individuals we are trying to serve? And how do we understand our relationship to them in a different way? Um, so when we think about the transfer solution and the transfer problems and what those priorities are, at least from a California perspective um, over the last four years, we've really been trying to understand how do we leverage the realities of legislation and financial um, state budget priorities. Uh, bachelor degree programs, common course numbering, again, um, uh, ADTs, all sorts of different solutions that are being put in place. How do we leverage all of those to try to understand how do we, how do we uh, dismantle and reconstruct what we are trying to do to become much more that red learn box? Um, it's almost like how do we leverage all of these different investments that the world wants or our state wants and use them as Trojan horses to push through a different type of solution that will get us closer to what we need to become in order to remain viable as institutions, but also then to really benefit the, the individuals in our respective communities. So um, lots, lots to unpack there, but I'll That's pause there. That's wonderful. All right, this is so excellent. So you all now have a sense for why these are some of my favorite people. Uh, to interact with. These are such big questions and they are practical questions uh, for you as well in the states where you're working. So I want to pull us up for a minute here. I'm going to ask you, Sarah, to kick us off uh, to talk a little bit more about the right kind of data. So for everything that we're talking about, the work that needs to happen, and if you want, you can leave, the, you can leave that visual up if it's not a hassle for you all, but if it is, you can take it down. Um, but we know that data, evidence uh, about, you know, sort of who is benefiting, who is being left behind, what is actually happening, how do we have the right conversations, because Marty, what you just described is profoundly countercultural work. The work that you're trying to do, Kenyatta, profoundly countercultural in Texas, right? I mean, to create and to remake systems so that they work, right? We know that data and evidence is an essential piece of this. So Sarah, I want to ask you, uh, to kick us off, um, you know, what are the right kind of data for the work that needs to happen? Yeah, I really appreciate, Marty, I jotted it down, how do we make the familiar strange? I think we also need to make our familiar ways of measuring student progress really strange to ourselves, right? And so a lot of the same problems that plague post-secondary data systems generally are just magnified when you start to think about mobile students. So our federal systems really have this myopic focus on first-time, full-time students, and that's how we measure enrollment, and it's how we measure, um, you know, like shares of students that succeed, shares of students that receive Pell Grants, all of those kinds of things. So these students that we're talking about today that are mobile, that make up just this increasingly huge share of the post-secondary population today, they're missed as soon as they hit that second institution compounding these problems, right? Okay, so maybe the federal level isn't the right way to measure this problem. If you look at institutional systems, they weren't really built for any kind of interoperability between school to school. You know, institutions maybe across the street from each other and their data systems could be vastly different from one another when it comes to facilitating any kind of cross communication at a student level about what people are learning and when they're learning it and whether or not they could cross the street and complete a course across the street or not. Um, and the one system that does this a little bit better, the National Student Clearinghouse, is proprietary, right? So we have some pretty significant hurdles when it comes to providing easy to access, publicly available information about student mobility. And I think that all of this comes together to really say that if anything, we're probably underestimating student mobility today. And so even though I've tried to kind of introduce this idea to everyone today that, okay, it's more than you think, it's probably even more than we think. Um, the extent to which students move around today. And so I want to give some examples of research questions given our current data landscape and data environment that I wish were easy to answer, but we just can't answer, right? So how much learning do students who attend multiple institutions repeat? It's not an answerable question right now. How much money do they spend repeating that learning? Not an answerable question right now. Stated differently, how much revenue do institutions collect for that repeated learning? Not an answerable question right now in any kind of empirical way. 
Um, what's the time to credential for students that start at one institution and finish at their third, fourth, second, fifth? Um, which kinds of credentials are these students earning? And what are their motivations for mobility? Right? So I think that the way we think about mobility today is that, okay, gosh, should be avoided at all costs. The GAO estimates that you're going to lose 43% of your credits every time you move institutions. You really shouldn't do it. And that can lead to this really problematic deficit-based understanding of mobile students, right? Oh, they just made a bad choice. Of course they lost credits, right? Like, as a parent, as a person who works full-time, like, I'm not making these kinds of choices only around finishing a post-secondary credential, right? These students today face real issues that require mobility. And so embracing that through our systems is really key. So I feel like I've given you the opposite of your question. I've told you a whole bunch of what doesn't work when it comes to measuring things today. But um, I mean, really, of course, I'm a researcher too. So it doesn't get any better than, than student level data for me when we think about how to best measure student progress and student success when they're attending multiple institutions, increasingly in multiple counties and multiple states and multiple places and ways. No, that's great. And I want to turn it to Kenyatta and Marty on this as well, thinking about data. And it doesn't need to be, what are the data that may mean? The question about what are the things that we can't answer now that we absolutely have to begin to answer mm -hmm. for real, right? The mm -hmm. data question. So you can commit this however you'd like, but Kenyatta, uh, how does data, how, how does that figure into the work that you're leading? It's interesting, uh, I mentioned Alamo College's district and that compact, and they're actually trying to measure that, but I think it's, uh, to your point, um, on the dollars that are spent by students um, and families and households, and sometimes it's state and federal dollars and mm -hmm. local dollars, um, if there was one metric to really press this imperative that we've got to fix this pretty quickly, and, and because we think about I'm reminded of the Great Recession, not the Great Recession, but the pandemic when it really hit hard um, and how many people had to quickly transition out of hospitality and tourism into another field. They may or may not have had a degree, they had some skills, um, but some had to actually start back over and re-verify uh, that they had the skills necessary to get there. What that cost looked like really is one slowing down the the workforce system one but more importantly for them the households and individuals you know can we start to calculate to your point what what really does this mean when we have transfer and credit mobility systems that are actually for certain populations costing them double triple even probably more to get the exact same degree as their as their counterpart yeah so i love this question i mentioned data and equity earlier um what I would highlight, at least for our California work, one of the things that we really had to wrestle with is exactly what Sarah was noting. What is the data that we don't have? And how much are we creating stories about solutions and outcomes and strategies based on non-data, mm -hmm. right? It's, uh, is it more expensive? Is it less expensive? Are we making more money? Are we making less money? Is it, you know, who's getting through and why are they not getting through? but we actually don't have the data. So a key example of that would be um, this desire to increase diversity of uh, students to our UC and CSU system, our public four-year systems. And a lot of the pressure was on the community colleges to increase the diversity of students who are applying. Um, and part of that push was we need to focus on marketing. Mm -hmm. And as I like to say, if, if you think the solution is that we just need to tell a better story you know, and, and make people more aware we have missed the mark completely. Mm. But what we didn't have was the application data. We have the enrollment data. Who actually gets into our public four-year institutions? So is the problem that we don't have enough people applying, or is the problem that we don't have enough people getting accepted? Mm. And or, because we did have the acceptance and the yield data. So how many students got accepted but did not enroll? And what we found is that a significant number of students, maybe 30,000 students, got accepted but did not actually enroll in our four-year CSU system. 30,000 students, how about we start there? With 30,000 students who were eligible, applied, accepted, jumped through all the hoops, 
but didn't actually end up enrolling in those institutions? And what was the diversity breakdown of those students? And what was the financial aid issues or implications or mobility issues? I have to relocate from here to here in order to get in. And how much were our solutions like um, our associate degree for transfer program, which is, is fantastic, but has the challenge of you are guaranteed a spot within the system, not necessarily a spot within your uh, institution of choice. So if I'm a parent, and I live in community A, and I get accepted into the system, but have to go to institution B, you know, uh, in Northern California versus Southern California, eight hour, six hour drive, hour plus flight, I'm not relocating. I am letting go of that opportunity because I can't get in here, I can only get in there. So those are our structural issues, but right away the solution, because it is familiar and easy to sort of point fingers at students and potentially community colleges or community colleges and four years pointing at K-12, right? However, whoever we need to blame down the, down the road, right? Um, you know, well, we just need a more diverse applicant pool, but we don't actually have that data. We right. didn't actually have access to that data. So there's, there's a lot to unpack on the data conversations and then being sure that we're having, um, that we are all focused on the right conversations around what's the data. The other thing I'll just point to, because we're talking about transfer, is um, what surfaced in some of our conversations was that we also didn't have the data on what competitive criteria looked like. Mm. We have the academic proficiency. So, you know, we just need students to be more prepared. I'm like, nope, all these students are prepared. What's the competitive criteria? What is preventing them from being accepted? And we're not having those conversations publicly, right? We are having those sort of on the side and we just want more students from, uh, or we need a more diverse um, application pool from your colleges, your community colleges. We take all the Santa Monica students because they are familiar and we trust that. Uh, but those Lassen College students, mm, we don't know them and we don't know that institution. So we may have a bias and we're not talking about the competitive criteria that is well beyond the uh, academic preparation criteria. Excellent, thank you. All right, so I want to make sure if my if you as panelists have any questions for each other or directions you want to go with this, you take it there. So I do, I, but I do want to ask, as you look forward uh, at the most important work that needs to happen or at the horizon, right, at the new economy uh, that is, uh, that exists and the systems and structures that are in place that, that don't align with the reality, right? Um, what is on the horizon for you? We're gonna, in a little bit, I'm gonna get to what are you most worried about and what are you most excited about? But for right now, just as you think about the horizon, what's coming and the most important work to be done. And Kenyatta, I'm gonna start with you uh, for Texas. You know, as you look at the, the landscape, what is, what's coming and what are the most important conversations and work that need to happen? Well, there, there are a lot. Yeah. Topics there. I'll start first in the secondary education space, and Texas has done a phenomenal job of making sure that dual credit access is available to, to all students. And I think through what's happening down the street uh, at the Capitol, uh, if the Community College Finance Commission uh, recommendations pass through, there will be even more energy and support for that. However, uh, when you look at the college going rate in Texas, uh, it's 45%. Uh, so more than half of the students, in spite of having some post-secondary experiences, are saying no thank you to higher ed. Uh, part of that is because of the issue we just mentioned, which is you can take some of these courses in high school, but they don't necessarily transfer over. Um, so we see a big disparity in um, sometimes, unfortunately, providing students with college credits that don't apply towards a degree or um, why recommend going an associate of applied science route when the student may or may not know that that's the path that they want to go to and if it's not available for licensure why are you even forcing them in that pathway so i think on the dual credit side we've got a lot of work to do to make sure that students feel very comfortable about their pathway forward into post-secondary education uh, i'd say the the other one that's really big right now is just the understanding of short-term and non-degree credentials and how we bring that into the, the credit mobility conversation. Uh, we've, and within Educate Texas, are starting to rethink the whole conversation of credentials of value. I think that has a space, but what we've learned in some communities is that non-degree credentials aren't necessarily for a true pathway gain in and of itself. 
but it may actually be a way in which we can expand access points uh, by taking those non-degree credential experiences, they now have more confidence that they can do college. And so how do you honor those experiences towards credit towards a degree? Uh, because this is a really a, a cost effective, not necessarily a risk free, but for individuals who are not sure that higher education is where they should go to take a short term credential experience and get that credential um, and earn that, you know, we have to make good on those experiences towards a degree without punishing them to take courses back over, but more importantly, uh, recognizing that the wave of individuals, residents that are taking non-degree credentials means that it's not a competitive element against higher education. If you think about it in the right way, it's actually more access points for higher education to enroll students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. All right, big picture horizon pieces here. Who wants to dive in? Marty, Sarah? Yeah, go that for works. it. That um, works. So big picture, one of the things that uh, is on the horizon for the California system as part of our common course numbering effort uh, is really beginning to look at what are the course taking patterns for individuals who do transfer, mm -hmm. how successful are they in completing their degree programs uh, versus native students uh, who start at that institution, what are their course taking patterns and what is their progress towards completion. For folks in the audience, I don't know how many of you are familiar with um, uh, alternative placement, uh, the um, math and English remediation reforms, where we looked at the data and we said, hey, students who uh, are assessed in below uh, transfer level and um, we put them in remedial math and English courses, they're actually less likely to be successful than if we just put them in transfer level with additional supports um, and really looked at their prior courses. That has completely turned higher ed upside down, at least in California, relative to math and English. Um, and then we've also seen as a result of that, um, you know, stadiums, I, I'm told soccer stadiums, not necessarily football stadiums, uh, soccer stadiums full of more students completing math and English in their first year, transfer level math and English in their first year. That was based on data, an analysis of the data and what's actually working and how do we test some of the assumptions we make given the structures we've put in place and then where is the bias inherent in the structures uh, that were put in place ages ago. So when I think about this, what we have been trying to do in California is really try to understand what is the equivalent uh, data analysis that needs to happen relative to what we know about students who successfully transfer and successfully complete their bachelor degree. Do they really need all of the different hurdles, barriers, requirements, et cetera? Do native students have to, native to the four year, right? First time freshmen in four year, those four year institutions, do they have similar course taking patterns? And then does all of this really matter once they get out and are viable in the workforce? And this takes me back to this visual. Again, once upon a time we assumed people needed, we're gonna pack it all in at the front end and we're gonna push them out into the world with all this knowledge and they're gonna be amazing. But we know things are moving exponentially quickly. And so what is the relationship of what we are doing within our educational systems and what that means on the outside uh, when they get into the world of work, assuming that these are sort of two different experiences. Many of our students are working adults. Um, however, so does our assumption about what they need when they come to us, either within the two year or in the transfer institution, is it even relevant when they get out? No one's done that analysis. And so that's part of what we are trying to push on as we try to think about what is a common course numbering system. I mentioned Trojan horse, right? What does a common course numbering system look like? And how do we use data to understand what, what is going to be meaningful about that structure and what is, it, what is actually needed when they transfer to a four-year institution? Great, thank you. And I'm gonna let you dive in here in one second. I just wanna uh, observe that one of the things that I think is so encouraging about this conversation and the apt title of this panel, Beyond Transfer, it, uh, until quite recently, transfer was, you know, viewed as a moment in time, a transactional mm -hmm. moment, right? The relationship, the profound relationship between scaled reform of remediation, credit mobility, transfer student success was not particularly well understood, right? Transfer was some subset of some population over here, and if you had the name transfer in your title at your institution, you were connected to it in some way. It is now increasingly evident, I think, in places like Texas and California that Credit mobility, transfer uh, is everybody's problem and everybody has to own it together. I really you know, appreciate the kind of 
you know, moving out of the two-year, four-year competition lens into credit mobility to signal, right, as you were saying, Kenyatta, that we're in it together. This has to be about joint responsibility to students and about students actually centered, not in word, but in deed, right, and how we frame conversations. So very much appreciate that. Sarah, what do you want to dive in on? Yeah, sure. So I think in terms of next steps um, at, S at Ithaca SNR, we're thinking of three big things, policy, technology, and practice. Um, we think that these are three of the main levers and supports for a more holistic understanding of credit mobility for today's students. So on the policy front, kind of as you were just saying, Allison, you know, coming together and making some of these choices, right? There's really just this patchwork of institutional policies and some system level policies and MOUs and things like that here and there. I don't want to undercut that really good work that is already happening, but there's so much, there's potential for so much more, right? Um, understandings of student mobility that really expand past just vertical two to four year institutional transfer and that recognize and validate and don't treat as, um, as a deficiency, right? That students could go between four-year institutions. They could go between two-year institutions. They could learn some things in a registered apprenticeship. They could learn some things through dual enrollment in high school and that all of this learning should really count towards a student's credential. And second on the policy front, I really think we need to rebalance the funding incentives for institutions to accept learning rather than only charging tuition. And um, that's something that I'd probably only say on the South by stage <laughs> and not in any other convening, right? But I really think that we need to rethink those funding incentives and get them aligned to get institutions to accept learning, not just charge for credits. Um, when it comes to technology, if you try to window shop institutions, if you have a couple of transcripts from a couple of different institutions, and you just want to see, like, who's geographically proximate to me that is affordable for me and that would give me a credential based on, you know, just a couple more years of learning? How many more courses would I need to take? What kind of courses would they be? What kind of modalities are they offered in? Um, will they accept my learning that I've done at work? It's a nearly impossible task, right? It's very difficult for students to just... I, window shopping is the best way that I can describe it, right? To just say like, okay, well, what could fit? What could work for me to move forward and to complete my credential? There are some technological solutions that we think can support and help students with this. Um, we have one at, at SNR called Transfer Explorer or T-Rex um, that we're scaling within the CUNY and SUNY systems now that is focused just on course and credit transfer, but has the potential to unlock a lot more um, for mobile students today. And then finally, um, practice changes. I think there are some really just short-term practice reforms that institutions and supporters of mobile students can make, right? Recognizing the trade-off of some of these cohort-based programs that leave students with little bits of learning along the way if they have to leave out of lockstep in a cohort model, right? So for years, I worked at an institution called Regis University in Denver, and we had, you know, we, we trained a ton of the area's nurses, right? But when we modularized the courses into two weeks of anatomy and two weeks of respiratory health and two weeks of whatever, if students dropped out of that, lock, of that lockstep model with their cohort, it was very difficult for them to transfer. And so I think there's a lot of good things that can be unlocked through these cohort models. Um, increased retention and success for many students, but it can't come at the expense of mobile students having random learning that they can't take anywhere. Um, or, or documents. So those are some of the things that I would start with for, for us in terms of next step policy, technology, and practice. Right on. Well, I sort of want to dig in on technology for just a second. Sure. And I don't know if, we, if that's something that you all feel amenable to or not, but um, you know, as you were talking about the kinds of things that technology can make possible for students, you know, I think there's always the tendency to uh, sort of the human tendency for wishful, toward wishful thinking about technology that solves problems that are actually only solved by humans. But there, you know, that balanced against the fact that there are tremendous opportunities, newer opportunities in technology that can make transparent to, you know, you were talking about what, what are course taking patterns? How are things transferring? You know, when we think about uh, credit evaluation practices, writ large, how are credits evaluated? To make that transparent through technology or through other means just strikes me as immensely um, promising because you, because it, uh, because you get to counter assumptions about mm -hmm. who students are or how they are, you know, it's like, let's stop making assumptions about, you know, how things are happening and let's start looking at how credit evaluation practices, for example, is occurring. So I just wanna ask, 
Is there anything else that, you know, Kenyatta or Marty, you want to say about the technology piece of this, or even the policy piece? I mean, their legislators never get tired of legislating you in California, you know? Uh, <laughs> so if there's anything you want to jump on on either of those, we'd love to hear it from both of you. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Um, I will say on the technology piece, um, the, the legislation is true. They love, they love us. Um, <laughs> It's a love, uh, love relationship. Uh, <laughs> on the technology piece, I think, um, you know, California tends, now that I'm no longer with the state chancellor's office, I can say this. Um, they, not only do they love to legislate us, but they are also very generous in providing resources to facilitate implementation, which is phenomenal. But, you know, as they say, more money, more problems. Um, what we get is a million different vendors contacting all of our institutions and our state office trying to sell us, pitch us the next technology solution. And so many people lean into that promise of, ooh, if we just are able to do this, but if we adopt this, it'll solve all our problems. I have not seen it work yet. Uh, decades in, have not seen it work yet. But part of what we've been wrestling with is that what that then perpetuates is this belief that there's technology panaceas over here that aren't real, right? Or technology oasis that is not real versus an actual viable modern infrastructure, technology infrastructure for our systems, whether that's our data infrastructure, our student uh, interfacing platforms, all of those pieces, and the, um, the AI right, some, some meaningful intentional AI to understand what patterns are emerging uh, around student activity um, and even our own institutional activity. Part of what, so the state investment and ongoing investment and uh, modernization of infrastructure is critical and often overlooked, particularly as um, too many of our elected officials uh, end up just hot potatoing problems to the next person. Right, mm, that's not. That's going to take a longer time. So we're not going to jump in there. We're going to we're going to wait and uh, focus on something that seems more immediate in terms of a win. Um, the other thing I would just point to, though, is that as an educational system, our culture and our identity are really threatened with the emergence of technology and AI solutions. And so that's something that we are really having to wrestle with. Is I have a particular belief, whether conscious or subconscious, about the process of going through equivalency, of looking at those transcripts and reviewing that content and making a judgment call that I believe is unbiased. However, when we look at the patterns of data, mm -hmm. it's actually not that same story of what I think is my lived experience or what I have what I have had as my lived experience in a classroom working with students, et cetera. And so it's really challenging our belief about what our identity is, what our role is, and who is worthy to participate in our systems of education versus what is our job to um, try to help those who are unworthy. Even if we're not consciously saying it that way, that is really how it plays out. And so there is this tension with the technology solutions that we have to continue to unpack relative to ourselves as education professionals. Great, thank you. All right, technology, policy, practice, choose your own adventure here, Kenyatta. I choose technology. All right, <laughs> behind door two, we will find all your easy answers. Uh, yeah. You know, on the technology side, I, I am seeing promising ways in which syllabi are being scanned for course objectives and course competencies that hopefully one day we'll have a solution to rid of enough of the bias out of the system so we can improve equity outcomes for our students. I'd say the other thing on technology that's been promising to me is the, the movement around learner-owned records. Yeah. And uh, you know, I'm not sure that we have done the best by our residents, by everyone owning a data system that has information about that student that can never come together to tell their full story. And so, you know, we're starting to see a lot of regional practices where learner-owned records is the central source by which employers, institutions, and support organizations can view that student more holistically and also begin to sort of write into that transcript, that ledger, things that really count towards their degree or, or the skills that they have. And on the policy side, I think the, the challenge is that the conversation from what I've heard around transfer still is a two-year to four-year conversation. And then in some other committee meeting, they're talking about the number of open jobs that are available. Uh, they're not making the connection that you have uh, millions of Texans, that uh, they have some college where there are four million with some college, no degree. 
the question is what's necessary to get them to the completion to demonstrate those skills and competencies to be available for all of those job openings that are out there. There's a disconnect, I think, in policy of understanding that transfer really is a workforce issue as well. And if they can make that connection, I think that also changes the conversation. Oh, amen. Yeah. Uh, I have a note from one of our previous conversations as we we're getting ready for this. You know, you mentioned making good on the promise of economic mobility through transfer and credit mobility. And these are profoundly disconnected conversations in policy and in practice within institutions as well, right? And so uh, really tricky here. So I do want to signal, oh, yep, I got the signal that 15 minutes. I do want to open it up for questions as you're thinking about your questions. Here we've got microphones that we can take around. Just raise a hand if you have a question. And while that is happening, uh, I do want to ask my colleagues here to talk about, so here's the thing, do we do what are you worried about first or what are you excited about first? Oh. You want to go the negative route? I mean, my tendency is to always go for the negative thing and be like, all right, what's the problem? What are you really worried about? But I also want to give space to what are you most excited about or what do you feel most optimistic about? So choose your own adventure, colleagues, uh, whichever way you'd like to come at it first. Um, so I also lean towards anxiety as just a general way yes, of being. Yes, yes, <laughs> Kind of the same cloth in this regard. So I'll go for worried. What I'm really worried about is this like systemic disadvantaging of mobile students continues. And we keep forcing students to decide against higher education because they're deciding for their families or for their career path. We're putting students in these really impossible decision sets and I'm gonna use like the collective we as people that care about or provide or, or advise higher education leaders, right? We, we're not putting ourselves in the best position to support these students the best and to get them to say yes to us as it currently stands. And so what I'm really worried about is that this systemic issue will just continue and, and perpetuate. That's great. Don't talk about what you're excited about yet. We'll do that next. No, I don't, right. I don't do excitement. All right. <laughs> Kenyatta, what are, you worried, what are you most worried about? Uh, you know, again, I think the role of higher ed and training providers is to facilitate the conversation between the resident and their promising career pathway. You know, when we look at the enrollment declines, uh, we look at what student preferences are. They prefer, it was one study that showed employer training was more preferred over going to a community college. Um, if, if we in higher education don't, you know, correct our course to, to make sure that we're a proper facilitator, and don't spend too much time, don't charge too much money uh, to make sure that that facilitation happens. I'm worried that a, a second, uh, more viable channel of training education is going to happen. That's going to be the preferred choice for most residents, more so than you know our colleges and universities that have been sort of that conduit for so long. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I would agree wholeheartedly with my colleagues up here. Uh, those are my worries, and I think about uh, you know if I were to add something to the conversation. Um, you know, I, I wrestle with uh, the extent to which our institutions are becoming learning institutions fast enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, our institutions, higher ed institutions, are not learning organizations, right? They, are, they facilitate classroom and instructional teaching. The extent to which we facilitate learning, and are we educating people, which is something we do to them, or are we facilitating their, uh, the accumulation of learning and or advancement of learning. Um, as non-learning organizations, we are holding on to status quo and just staying stuck in our processes as opposed to cont uh, having a culture of adaptation and evolution. And if we're not evolving, we're going extinct. Mm -hmm. right? uh, so just exactly what my colleague said here, that is my biggest worry. Thank you. All right, we got a question and then we'll get to excitement as well. We're not gonna leave you in the depths of despair here, I promise. All right. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Milan. Uh, I'm a part of that 60% that graduated college by also getting credentials from uh, Foothill College, actually, in California. I wanted to ask, the process, there's a lot of data that the students are actually providing. You mentioned that there's a lack of data uh, to be able to make decisions or, and understand really why there's a certain echelon of students who are getting accepted and then not actually coming to school. Why, why do you not have that data? Um, where, what is the blockage? Because as students, as, as you know, people applying to college, every piece of data that the, a young person owns is being given. Um, so where is the disconnect? Right. Uh, this is a great question. Um, I think this goes back to the collective will to actually change and resources to change our state infrastructure. So California's 
higher ed system, like many systems, uh, has grown up over the decades, right? New, in, new college pops up here, new college pops up there 50 years ago. Um, every institution has their own, or every district, we have 73 districts, each one has their own local board, their own local data systems, their own local everything. Um, none of those aggregate up, and when they do aggregate up, they only aggregate up within the community colleges. They don't actually connect to our K-12, our CSU, or our UC. So no one's interconnected. There is an effort in California right now to put uh, in place a, 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 a cradle-to-career data system, right? a longitudinal data system that would put everything in place. But again, this would create trans a level of transparency that is uncomfortable. So this is that cultural piece of do we really want to know? Right? And what questions do we really need to be asking and who is going to benefit and who is going to be harmed by them? Put that in air quotes. What I would say is that as institutions, as full systems uh, across California and across any state who has this issue, uh, we will ultimately be harming ourselves by not moving in this direction. But too often we don't see it because we haven't become an organization that can say this actually isn't working for us. That goes back to that learning organization where I can look at something and say this no longer serves me, right? It no longer serves our institution or our population. It no longer serves our viability. But then this is the other piece. There's a whole ecosystem that's holding things static. And so that's part of the challenge. How is this gonna impact my funding? Because trying to explain this to legislators who don't live in education, right? No, no judgment there. They don't live in education. They're trying to run a state. So this is a small piece of that, and you're, we're constantly trying to create a new experience when their experience was their educational experience. Right. And that cre this, again, goes back to identity and what I believe as an individual and what I am comfortable facilitating in this moment when we're not quite there yet as a, as a full um, industry sector. Yep. Thank you. Great question. Mm -hmm. All right. Do we have another question here for us? Did I see another hand around? Um, so mine's for Kenyatta. You mentioned learner-owned records, and I work for a nonprofit, and we have an open source learner digital wallet. So I'd love to hear just about the receptiveness in your state to technology like that. I think the reception has been quite strong. There are several regions, Dallas, um, San Antonio, uh, Houston, other places that have begun to think about how to make that work and work for the student. You know, early evidence of some successes have been uh, employers being able to have things like apprenticeship and internship fairs where they can communicate in a much more seamless manner and be able to look at all of the collective experiences of the student. Uh, I've even heard of some systems where universities, not just in Texas, but abroad, um, can, you know, across the nation, can look in that record if given access and auto award scholarships and funding to the student to help them make those decisions. So um, the challenge is, is getting everyone on board to, to adopt this as the system. You still have your own management systems for students, but I think if you look at it from an ecosystem perspective or a community or regional perspective, um, if you build it the right way, um, I think what we all agree on is that it shouldn't be on the student or the resident to have all of these transactions to, to prove that I want and I should be in college, but it should be, you know, all of these things coming to bear in one system to say, hey, you, you are valuable, we, we appreciate you and we recognize what you have accomplished and what your potential is. But there are several cities and communities across Texas that have begun to adopt that model. All right, I think we have time for one more question before we turn it over to the kind of close up here around what are we, what are the panelists most excited about? Is there another question or should we turn it? Oh, I see, thank you. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm Lisa, I'm with the National College Credit Recommendation Service. So a lot of what you're talking about with the transferability and credit mobility is something that we speak to on a daily basis with what we do by evaluating non-collegiate learning for college credit equivalency. So my question is, when we're talking about prior learning assessment and you're thinking about how all of that comes together in multiple sources and ways, is there thoughts and considerations around emergent learning? So when we talk about transferring, it seems past, past learning, but what about the industry credentials of value and certifications along the way 
particularly for a, a four-year student or adult learner that may take many, many years in their trajectory to degree completion. And we know, particularly in fields of technology, these certifications and industry credentials are, they're fastly changing and rapid, at a rapid pace. And so I guess my, I'm not sure if it's a question or a ponderance about where are we in that mindset of not just prior learning, but emergent learning along the way. I have, a, I have a thought. I'm not sure if it's exactly to this question, um, but I will point to California's efforts around uh, direct assessment competency-based education. And I, I think we've thrown on the term competency-based education for quite some time, in, specifically in California for a couple of decades. We have you know, competency-based certifications and whatnot, but we haven't really dug into the um, instructional methodology of what it means to offer uh, direct assessment competency-based education. We recently passed uh, regulations that allow for direct assessment competency-based education, and we are currently changing our apportionment funding model in order to facilitate campuses who want to offer this. What we've also simultaneously done, though, is um, fund a pilot cohort of colleges, faculty members, and disciplines to create full transfer degrees uh, full transfer programs that are 100% direct assessment competency-based education. And the reason why I keep saying direct assessment is because the hyper-focus is on learning. On what is that learning model? How do we understand and facilitate and assess learning? And so part of the game I would love to see happen is how do we, how do we begin to move beyond credit for prior learning? And how do we just begin to understand how we as institutions transcript learning? wherever that happens, because it may happen in a classroom and it may not, right? But if we're really about facilitating and scaffolding learning and really walking alongside individuals on their professional journey for a lifetime, right, then we have to have a different model. What this has prompted, and the reason why I think this is so, at least for me, was so significant for California, is that we talked about what is the role of punitive grading, because in direct assessment competency-based education, there is no punitive grades. You just haven't gotten there yet. That's a complete mindset shift for our faculty members, where I'm supposed to be gatekeeping whether or not you deserve to move on or not, right? And so how do we begin to engage professional educators in, at least at the four-year and two-year institutions, in this mindset shift of my role is actually to facilitate your learning, however you get there, however long that takes, uh, rather than police whether or not you get to progress. Um, and, you know, that can seem harsh, but that is, is my job to judge or is my job to facilitate? And that's a, that's a really big paradigm shift. Um, so when I think about where does credit for prior learning, um, all of these, um, uh, you know, uh, transcripting of other uh, credentials, whether it's industry credentials, military credentials, whatever it might be, I really think that we need a culture shift. Otherwise, we will never see our institutions be able to, um, our students be able to benefit within our institutions from those experiences unless we have a model where that's actually facilitated. I will also just say it's a full ecosystem. So California community colleges could get there, but if the four years don't get there, they're still looking under the hood. They're still accepting some and not accepting others from our institutions. And so we all, we really need the full ecosystem to shift. Great, thank you. All right, we got two minutes here. So Sarah, we have to start with you. What are you most excited about? And then to you, Kenyatta. Um, I'm most excited about just the increased awareness around issues of student mobility and even just talking about mobile students as a you know discrete population of post-secondary students today that are deserving of support and services and success, just like a, any other student that engages with higher education. So I'm most excited about that. Awesome. All right, Kenyatta, what are you most excited about? I'm excited about the signaling that residents and students are giving us in higher education. They're not rejecting higher education, they're rejecting our version of it. And so their preferences are giving us information that change is, is finally here that we need to take, take on. Amen. Love it. All right. <laughs> I'm personally most excited that I get to be here with these uh, <laughs> amazing individuals who are doing this work, who are having these conversations similar to the state advisor or the national advisory panel and several of the comments that came up in the audience, that folks are engaged in this and willing to have these conversations is phenomenal. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here today. And I want to ask our audience here to join me and thank their panelists.